Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here today. In January, I talked about how those of us in the State House need to focus on the fundamentals, to consider the impact and the cost of every decision we make on the families and places that need our help most, and to prioritize communities that have been left far behind for far too long. And as I said then, thanks to all the federal money and state surpluses, we have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to do just that, increasing economic equity from region to region, which will benefit our communities and families all across the state. This team behind me and their teams behind them work for months building this budget with these goals in mind, putting together policies and making strategic investments so that all the pieces work together in order to put us in a better financial condition uh, for decades to come. The budget we presented to the legislature in January prioritized low and moderate income Vermonters with tax relief, historic child care subsidies, increased dental care, permanent homes for the homeless, more housing for middle income families, upgrades to water and sewer and mobile home parks, weatherizing homes, funding for career training, and much, much more. Next, we focus on revitalizing communities with a plan to bring back employers to rural parts of the state, cleaning up contaminated industrial sites, and focusing on small business development, housing, growing the workforce, and supporting community-led public safety. We also made sure there was state money to leverage federal funding for the next three to four years so we can help communities by upgrading roads, bridges, water, sewer, stormwater, and more. But unfortunately, the budget coming out of House Appropriations cuts or removes almost every single initiative I just talked about. Not only that, but they also increased the state general fund budget over the last year by 12%. 12%. They did that by spending over $60 million more than I propose in ongoing base expenditures. They also put a lot of pressure on future budgets by doing things like only paying for one-third of the startup costs for their paid leave program, leaving $74 million unfunded over the next two years. I think what they're banking on or hoping these unprecedented fiscal times fueled by federal dollars and state surpluses will continue when, in fact, their own economist says the opposite is true. And it's not just the startup costs for their generous new programs. It's ongoing money from tax increases for the benefits that come along with it. Not to mention the very real financial harm to Vermonters caused by the clean heat standard that the House has yet to take up. Three initiatives alone could add a half a billion dollars in costs on Vermonters every single year. What's also been lost is that we're already moving forward with a family and medical leave plan we bargained with state employees. And it will open up to businesses and individuals over the next two years. And it will be voluntary without having to add over 60 new state positions to oversee it that will struggle to hire. And I've also proposed $56 million in our budget to increase child care subsidies. This has been done without raising taxes and fees at a time when economic anxiety and inflation is already high. To put it simply, we can achieve our shared goals without putting us on an unsustainable economic path. I believe one of the reasons I was elected was to bring balance, common sense, and pragmatism to the table. And I think I've proven over the years that I'm not an alarmist. But I have to say, I'm very concerned with the direction we're heading in. And it's not because of my, some of my proposals have been cut. I understand the process, and neither side gets everything they want. That's how it works, but this year feels different. 
I'm truly worried about the seniors on fixed incomes, the working families who can't afford to pay more, and the communities who need our help most. And I also worry about how we will possibly pay for all of this as we look towards an uncertain economic future. In my opinion, if this budget passes, with all these big ticket initiatives that come along uh, with it all at once, it has the potential to hurt Vermont in both the short and long term. So I hope Vermonters are paying attention. Our budget proposal was built through a collaborative, thoughtful process where we weighed priorities and focus on those who need our help most. It was balanced and we fully funded new initiatives. It invested in future expenses to make sure we could ride out the economic downturn that's sure to come. And we did all of it without raising taxes and fees. I'm sorry to say the House budget does not meet those same principles. To make room for the over 50 million in increased spending in the BAA, which by the way, I warned against, they had to siphon off every bucket they could possibly find. They also had to increase taxes and fees, including on those who can least afford it. And the reality is this budget and the half a billion dollars in new taxes, fees, and penalties could eventually pass, even if I veto it, because they have a supermajority. If that happens, we'll not only have squandered this once in a lifetime opportunity, but we'll have turned it into a liability. So from my perspective, this is not business as usual in this building. It's more important than ever for Vermonters to know what decisions are being made and make their voices heard by calling their legislators. So with that, I'll open the questions. And uh, I have my team here to answer any that I can't. Governor, I'd imagine some of these policies like paid leave, child care, some of the big ticket items that you say you're concerned with, some Democratic leaders might say that it does require an upfront investment, but it will pay dividends later on and it will help our workforce, our demographics. I'd imagine that's what some might say. What, what do you say to that? How, how do you balance the, the upfront versus the, the benefits later I, on? I'd, share, I'd say our, our goals are shared. You know, we put a paid family leave program into place. It's voluntary. It uh, it's mimics the one we put in place uh, for our state employees, and uh, it'll be voluntary. Um, and it doesn't require all the upfront costs because we're using an outside provider. We're using someone, the Hartford in this case, uh, that is going to oversee it. They're well capitalized. We don't have to put that money up front. And, and they have the expertise to oversee it without having to add 50 or 60 employees that we can't hire. We have 800 employees right now that we need to hire, but can't find. We are retiring just as quickly, quickly as we put people on. So it seems to me there's a better way to do this and get to the shared goal. And I believe we'll be able to do it quicker than with their, their proposal. Now their proposal Again, you have to form the bureaucracy for paid family leave. You have to form the bureaucracy to oversee it. You have to put in place some sort of IT structure that's going to cost millions. I think, I think they've proposed it's like 30 or 40 million dollars to for the IT structure alone, plus the people to oversee that. And then you have to build a reserve. So that's going to take some time, like years, before it's put into place. Ours can be done in a, a lot less time than that. You mentioned that you were hoping that Vermonters would co contact their legislators about these issues. But what do you say to the Democratic leaders who say, this is the message they got from voters last November. They're doing exactly what people want them to do. Well, again, I'm saying we can have both. You know, I talk with Vermonters as much. I. I did fairly well in the last election, uh, and some of their same, their same constituents are my constituents as well, and they voted for me. Uh, and I talked about this voluntary uh, paid family leave program. 
increase child care. It's something that I've been concerned with since I first became governor. And in fact, I think I propose more than anyone else has. I, we came out of the gate uh, much quicker than the legislature did back six years ago. We increased subsidies. We've increased them more. We're, we're proposing to increase them more today. So it's not as though we don't have the shared goal. It's, it's always about the how. How do we get there the most efficient way possible without breaking the bank? So when you look at the payroll tax for the child care bill in the Senate, I know how you feel about the payroll tax for the paid family leave bill in the House. You look at the one in the Senate for child care and feel the same way about I it? I do. I mean, we, we were able to put $56 million towards this initiative without raising taxes and fees. I believe if we build this correctly, eventually we can get there where we'll be in the same position they, they want to get to. Um, but, uh, but again, we can do this without raising taxes and fees. We can do it with organic growth if we do all this right. Is there anything in the budget that you like, things that you think the legislature is going in the right direction? Well, again, our, we have shared goals. It's just the how we get there, always about the how. Um, so in our budget, we had paid family leave. Uh, in our budget, we had increased subsidies for child care. Um, there are many initiatives that we have a shared uh, goal in, in accomplishing. But take, for instance, I think it's in the, in the Senate, and this isn't the House, this is the Senate. Uh, for instance, uh, it appears they want to take away the child tax credit that they just put in place last year. It was in something we negotiated with them. It wasn't exactly what we wanted, but we wanted tax relief. So they decided this was a good way to do it with $30 million. It's been in there less than a year, and they want to claw it back to pay for something else. And again, I talk about it a lot, follow through, you know, the fundamentals. And, and I just feel as though we're moving backwards. We're clawing back all these initiatives that we thought were so important less than, less than probably eight months ago. So is your message to them fees and tax increases are off the table for, these, for all of these programs? I, I have said um, to many over the last few weeks, um, and I try not to overuse this because I've said I don't want to threaten vetoes, but if there's increased tax and fees during these times, these inflationary times, when we have so much state surplus and so much federal money, it seems counterintuitive that we would want to put more burden on Vermonters. If we do that and we don't match the federal money that we know is coming, we, we have upwards to a billion dollars coming our way, but we're going to have to match that. So, and we'd have no idea what's going to happen in the future. I've heard some comment in the, uh, in the legislature who have said, we always match the money. We always make it work. Well, not to this degree. I don't recall, I've been around here for close to 25 years now, I don't recall us getting a billion dollars from the federal government and having to match it. So it, the, these aren't normal times, and these aren't normal circumstances. And we should do everything we can, while we have money, to make sure that we plan for the future so we can make these investments so we can keep the economy going in the future with all these programs, all this money that we want to invest in our infrastructure. So that will help the economy move forward. So. Again, to get back to your original question, it doesn't include the match money. It raises tax and fees. It invites a veto. Governor, the, regarding <clears throat> the match, um, it appears, as I think you mentioned, they're setting a little bit aside, I think 10 million, but they're also raising fees at the DMV, uh, which is one of the ways that they plan to set aside some of the money for childcare and some of the bigger priorities, but raising the fees, which your administration um, has not had a fee bill uh, in the last six years or so. So I guess, how, how do you square those, those two? We've got the, um, you know, Democrats want to raise fees to help pay for their, their initiatives. We have the money. We don't need the money. 
right? I mean, we, we went back six years ago, I said, we don't need to raise tax and fees. We need to find other ways to grow this economy um, organically, grow revenue organically. And we've been successful doing that. In my view, these are regressive taxes and fees. These will hurt everyone across the board, not just the elite, not just those who have resources, but those who don't. Everyone who has to get a license or register their vehicle or do whatever they want to increase by a lot, $22 million. And I just think it's, it's unfair and unneeded. And, uh, and I uh, believe uh, that um, during these times, when we have budget surpluses and we can live within our means, that we shouldn't be putting more burden on everyday Vermonters. And that's what they're doing. Those costs, and, and it, they'll say, well, it does impact those larger trucks and so forth and so on. You know, I, I heard that it could increase uh, registration on certain vehicles, uh, higher um, weight trucks, by maybe $400. Well, where do you think, you know, these businesses are going to cover that? They're not going to absorb it. They're going to pass it on to consumers. So they'll pay it. They might pay it twice. I know you said you also, you meet with the pro tem and with the speaker, but do you meet regularly with the chair of the appropriations committees on the House or Senate side? No. I mean, I'm friendly with both, um, but I don't meet with them regularly. Could this maybe have been avoided or we could have gone to a different place I if you had? Did, I, did, I would have to ask, did any of you Listen to my budget address. Is any of this a surprise? I said every single word I said today in my budget address. And if anyone was paying attention, if legislators were there and listening, they should not be surprised by this. In terms of the transportation fees, uh, what about the argument that, you know, gas tax revenues are down, we've got a financial crisis coming in the transportation budget. And so raising the fees is really the most responsible short-term solution. Yeah, well, two things. One is, if they're doing this um, to match money, our match money will not be needed four or five years from now. This is ongoing, what they're doing, right? This is not going to end. They're not sunsetting this at the end of uh, three or four years. We started out six years ago uh, being probably the highest in terms of motor vehicle fees in the Northeast. Um, we're just catching up now. Uh, I don't think, I think we're still higher than most. So I just, again, think it's unnecessary. But don't forget uh, about the T-bill. Uh, we still transfer money out of the T-bill for, for general fund purposes. Uh, the JTOC a transfer. Now, at one time when I first came into the legislature, it was upwards to $47 million we transferred. Um, we were able to cut that back. Now it's down to about $20 million. And I'm not saying it's not needed, um, but the reason we, that JTOC transfer happened to begin with was because the general fund wasn't performing. The transportation fund was because of gas tax and so forth. Um, so it was, it was the place where there was a lot of money. That's where they went to. So they used that to buffer the general fund. Well, now it's turned around. You know, we still transfer 20 million out for general fund purposes, but the general fund's performing quite well right now. Maybe it's time to turn that around. Maybe it's time to stop transferring money out of the transportation fund for general fund purposes and let the general fund absorb that. Because we, we're transitioning to a new frontier as well. I mean, the gas tax has changed. The cars have gotten uh, much more efficient. So we're not collecting as much tax revenue. And we're moving with lightning speed, I might add, uh, to electrification. So we're going to have to find a different way, both on the federal level and the state level. And we put a proposal together, and we're listening to 
some of their ideas as well as to how are we going to um, put some sort of a user fee within the collection of, uh, of taxes or of the, for, from electric vehicles, which we don't today. And I know it's a small portion of, um, of our vehicles uh, now registered, but it's growing. It's up, I think it's five or six percent at this point. You said early on you're not an alarmist, but this year you feel something is different this year, right? Is that pretty close yeah. to that? What is going on in your mind? What's different? I think, you know, it's not as though I haven't faced a supermajority before, but now we have all this money, right? And so, and I, and I know there were a lot of promises made uh, during the election. I'm not blaming um, the, the House or the Senate in terms of following through on what they promised, but we have to be realistic here. And, and we, can't, we can't forget, and some, I don't know as some have gone through an economic downturn. Um, I've been through a couple, both in business and here in this building, and it's not pleasant. I, I think you probably remember, Bob, um, when we went through a downturn uh, under Governor Douglas's watch. There was a lot of a lot of rifts. A lot of state employees lost their jobs. I think upwards to maybe a thousand, and that happens quickly. And so, we don't live in this utopia. There's going to be a downturn. We saw the the, the effects of. Who, who, ever, who saw the bank closures happening on the national level coming? I, I didn't. I don't think anyone did. But it sent a ripple across the country. And again, we're OK. Everything's going fine. Uh, but, but if something like that were to happen, again, um, we'd see a downturn. And I, I think we have to be prepared for that. And if I'm wrong, great. You know, We'll have money available on the bottom line with a budget surplus that we can use to put towards those initiatives and grow it without raising taxes and fees. Governor, this is going back to something you said earlier, but when you're talking to, to legislators, are you getting the sentiment that they think that they can hit the federal matches despite paying for all of this? Is that kind of what, yeah. they're, what they're saying? Yeah, they're, they're betting that and hoping that we'll keep performing. Right? I mean, we're, we're seeing unprecedented uh, revenue coming through our coffers. But again, our economists, their economists have said, this isn't going to last. You know, there's a day of reckoning here. So um, we just need to be prepared for that. Let's not go in blindly and have to take something away. Let's build it so that they have faith in what we do so we don't have to take and do an about face. On um, similar but unrelated note, the House of Representatives today is taking up uh, the independent school bill as a result of the Supreme Court decision last year. Maybe Secretary French can weigh in as well. Um, this would bar funding from, from private schools um, and independent schools few of them. What, what are your thoughts on, on this proposal? Well, I, I probably have talked enough and got myself in enough trouble already, but I will say I'm, I'm a fan of independent schools. I think it's part of our educational system, uh, has been for, for decades, uh, if not centuries, and, and I think that uh, there's room for both. So I'm hoping that there'll be agreement in making sure that we protect all the resources we have so we give kids the best education possible. Let's go back to the kids. What's best for them? So I think there's, there's room for both. Secretary French. Yeah, Calvin, uh, you know, I've testified uh, earlier in the session on the topic. Um, you know, my, my perspective is we just came through a very contentious regulatory process. The State Board, to its credit, uh, strengthened the regulatory oversight of independent schools. Uh, the bulk of those rules go live in July 1, you know, of this year. Uh, so my perspective is let's, let's, uh, let's let those regulations go into effect uh, before we contemplate any further structural changes to the system. To the governor's point, it's a system that served Vermont and rural Vermont and places where I, I've worked quite well over the years. Um, and we have strengthened the regulatory approach, and um, I think those regulations should be given a chance. 
And with those regulations, are there any um, benchmarks or any protections to make sure, or I guess uh, regulations around discrimination, uh, making sure that state dollars don't go to um, institutions that might discriminate or might be exclusionary toward certain Vermonters? Yeah, that's an area where the State Board has taken some action on. Uh, it's, it's a point I've made in my testimony that I think that is an area where we could strengthen our statutory framework, uh, particularly around public accommodations. But uh, again, I think uh, that's been anticipated to a certain extent in the regulatory changes that the State Board has put forward. Do you have any thoughts on the reappraisal bill? No. Whether, whether or not it should move to the state, take it away from local municipalities and have the state do reappraisals? Yeah. I, I don't have thoughts on that. We have a, we have a tax commissioner right here. <laughs> um, I, I think it's a really big question, right? There are a lot of moving parts to that. So what our testimony was really focused on was let us study that, right? Let's figure out what the pros and cons are, what the transition period needs to look like. Um, so we were happy to be at the table to be part of the discussion, and we're happy to be part of the study and do that research and come back and report to the legislature. Um, I do think it might be a little bit premature for the actual transition to happen in law before we're able to report back on those studies and, and what it would actually take. Do you have the impression that the law or the bill at this point uh, assumes that the study will recommend uh, how the state can do it, but, but, but be more of a, a roadmap of how the state can achieve this goal? Um, well, certainly if, if it, the bill today is transitioning it, uh, so, so yeah, I think that is making an assumption that that would have to be the better approach. Um, so our hope would be that we could study it and then come back and, and talk about what that structure would look like if that's the best approach. Do you think having local appraisals is sort of an outdated concept these days? Uh, and, and given the problems that towns have, getting appraisals done on a timely basis, and so there's an argument for the state to do it? There's certainly an argument for it. That's, that's why we're having the discussion, right? But there's, again, a lot of unanswered questions, right? And not every community around the state is having the same struggles. Certainly some are. And we also want to acknowledge the system as a whole is really struggling, right? Um, the money that we're putting into the system today is producing about 16 reappraisals a year. Um, you know, there's over 250 municipalities that are, are part of the system, and over 160 of those now have reappraisal orders through existing law because of what the hot real estate market has done over the last few years. So it's certainly a discussion worth having, right? And we've got to try to figure out some solutions. Uh, I just don't know exactly what that best solution is today. But again, happy to be part of these conversations and, and do that study and, and come back to the legislature and, and work in partnership on that. Governor, Senator Kitchell has put out a proposal for paid parental leave only. It would be a universal program for workers, 12 weeks to bond with a newborn, $600 flat fee. Um, she says it would be not a huge administrative lift to do that. Um, is, is that a universal program that you would get by? Yeah, I mean, we like our approach, to be honest with you. Uh, we like uh, our paid family leave program that we've offered state employees. Uh, and we think we should be building off from that. Again, making sure that we have a structure to administer this, I think is important. I don't know what she's uh, contemplating, um, but, um, but again, I worry as much about the structure and the oversight and the building. Uh, paid family leave program isn't going to be easy to implement. This is going to be as complicated as unemployment. And we've seen, uh, you know, we've experienced uh, some of the, the pitfalls in that during uncertain times. And we'd have to build a system that mimics that uh, in order to best serve Vermonters. I'm saying there are entities outside of state government that do this for a living. And we wouldn't have to build a new structure. They have the expertise to do this right now. 
and they had the capital and reserves and so forth, so we wouldn't have to build those reserves. So I am uh, I'm in favor of, of going with that approach, and regardless of what happens, uh, I don't think that the state government needs to be a part of the oversight. Governor, the Senate uh, passed on second reading yesterday S-17, a sheriff reform bill. I'm wondering what you think of it. Yeah, I, again, I'm, uh, I'm trying to get with a couple of sheriffs uh, who I value their judgment right now. I know there is a difference of opinion across the board. I'm not sure that it's all partisan either. Um, so I am. Uh, I haven't. I haven't read it myself, um, but uh, but I plan in the next week or so to get with my uh, my associates who uh, who are more in tune uh, with what the difficulties are in implementing something like this. Do you think that the, the situations that we've had with various sheriff's departments do warrant legislative action, though? It could, yeah. I mean, we, we've seen um, what happened in Franklin County in particular. Um, so I, I, I think it's a good conversation to have. But again, it's about the how and what this actually does and how far it goes. Um, maybe, there's, maybe there's a compromise there somewhere. And then the Senate also uh, proceeded with S-4, the gun bill. They took out the section prohibiting uh, Vermonters under 21 from possessing semi-automatics, but there are other measures in the bill. I know we've talked about it before, but yeah. what's your latest read? I, my feelings haven't changed on that. Uh, again, I uh, mm -hmm. am concerned about how the enforcement and having weapons in your home, in your own home. and. And I believe in safe storage, by the way. I think the U.S. Attorney is doing a great job with public safety and some of our folks in trying to get the message out. I think people should uh, lock up their weapons uh, and, uh, and make sure that they're secure. So uh, I, again, worry about how we would enforce that and what that would mean. So do you mean you are in favor of safe storage to be an option and to encourage it among Vermonters, but do you think that legislative action is required yeah, on that? I, that's exactly what I'm saying. And I believe that uh, the U.S. Attorney uh, has taken on this initiative. Uh, we've been part of that. Uh, there's a lot of outreach. Uh, there's a lot of uh, ads that I'm seeing. Uh, and, I, and I believe that trying to educate people as to why this is so important is, is uh, going to be uh, something that's, I think, essential. Yeah, I mean, I've been concerned about that in the past, uh, obviously, uh, and uh, and I and I understand w why it's there. Um, what I haven't seen is the data to really back that up, um, and I know that uh, we what we see uh, with with suicides uh, by by using a, a weapon, a gun. Uh, is typically uh, done by uh, older males. And I would contend uh, that older males probably already have the weapon. So I'm not sure that it's going to have a dramatic effect. Uh, but, uh, but again, I understand why they're doing it. But I, I haven't seen the data to back up the claim. Would you be reluctant to sign it without the data? Um, well, I you know, vetoed something of close to that in the past. so. We'll see. I, I mean, it still has a ways to go. We talked about it a few weeks ago, and it was still in committee, but it overwhelmingly was voted in favor for in the second reading yesterday in the Senate, uh, Senate Bill 18, dealing with outlawing flavored tobacco, flavored e-liquids, things. And Vermont would join um, California, Massachusetts, obviously, that makes it all the way. Would this be a bill you're in support of? Yeah, I'm, uh, you know, anything we can do to reduce, prevent uh, kids from, from smoking, uh, I think is beneficial. I don't know if this does it or not. Uh, I'm also a little bit concerned about other flavored substances, you know, whether it's in cannabis uh, or whether it's in, in alcohol and so forth. I mean, how are we going to regulate that? How do we treat everybody the same? Um, so I think that's going to be an area of conversation in the future. So just speaking of cannabis, I mean, we've had a few months now of, of tax revenue rolling in. We've seen 
stores are opening up, we've got testing facilities, um, cultivators. What's your read, really? Of, I know we might have talked about this a few months ago, of how, how the market's working out so far. And I think so far, so good in some respects. I mean, it's a measured type of approach. I think we did it the right way. Uh, I was very concerned about uh, about uh, safety on our highways, and I think that we've the way we've done it has, and having this cannabis control board overseeing it has been helpful. So it's a measured approach, and it seems to be working out fine at this point, unless there's anyone who sees it differently. Hearing no one. <laughs> I want to give a couple folks on the phone the chance. We'll start with Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Hello, uh, Governor. Um, this is one. Um, have you seen the revenues coming in from the bills of cannabis, and are they anywhere close to what was projected? I, I heard revenue and anything close to what was projected. What, what was, was it one particular fund? No, uh, revenues from the sales of can and cannabis, oh. are they coming in as projected? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know that, um, but my feeling is that it's a little underperforming, but I said from the very beginning we shouldn't be counting on a lot of revenue uh, from this source. Uh, the more uh, other states do this, uh, the more it, um, it gets distributed uh, across the country. And um, so I, I'm, we've never really counted on all that revenue uh, to do anything in particular. Um, so, but I don't believe it's overperforming. Anybody, no? I'm hearing, I'm seeing some heads shake, no. Uh, it's not overperforming. Okay. Uh, you haven't. Um, there has uh, the legislature uh, put potential tax revenues in the budget? Um, I heard tax revenue in the budget. You've got my attention. <laughs> Has the legislature put any type of revenue that they're anticipating? Oh, I, th I think we d I think we all did count on something coming in from that. I can't even remember where it was going. It's about four million yeah. in total. Do you want to? Somebody want to sure. give that information? So there, there is about four million in total revenue anticipated from cannabis built into the budget as expected revenue. Thank you very much. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Mm -hmm. uh, quick question, Governor. You pointed out the fact that there hasn't been a lot of studies on the waiting period and the impact on uh, different uh, things, including suicide, but also homicide. There was a study, to your point, that was done in 2013 by the CDC. Uh, which showed that uh, it could reduce homicides by about 15%. Needless to say, in this day and age, a different study would be more appropriate. But my curiosity is, what's the downside to Vermont and to Vermonters to have a waiting period? What's the urgency? Yeah, I think it's just the, the constant erosion of individual rights. And um, so again, We'll, we'll see where this bill goes in the future. I know there's a sportsman coalition that is uh, working on this, and we'll see where, they, where it falls. And maybe they'll come to some sort of agreement and find it uh, palatable to everyone. I just don't know at this point. But I, it's just this constant erosion of, uh, of constitutional rights. Okay, that's all the questions I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any others in the room? Yes. Um, do you have any thoughts on House Bill 158 that will be on the floor today of expanding the bottle redemption system? I know this has been something in the works for sessions and years now. Yeah, I, I'm just not in favor of an expansion of the, the bottle bill. Uh, I think it was, uh, it was 
it was something that was unique in the beginning, and, and it did a lot of good. Um, but we've moved on from there. Uh, we have single source recycling uh, that I think that that's what we should be focusing on. Because if, if at the end of the day it's about trying to, to make sure that we recycle every product, that's the way to do it. Um, it's almost, from my perspective, it seems like what, what we've come up with and what they want to expand upon is almost like a Rube Goldberg type of approach to recycling. This doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so from a pragmatic standpoint, I just feel as though we should be moving in a different direction. But if we want to keep it the way it is right now and keep the redemption centers going and so forth and so on and, and not expand it, fine. Um, but, but I don't think it makes any sense to expand it. What do you say to supporters of the bill, though, who point out that 99% of bottles, containers that have a deposit redemption now are either recycled or redeemed? 99%. Well, I right, and I, so and the and that the the number for the single stream recycling plastic bottles is far lower. So if you really wanted to, it, they see this bill as an evolution from an anti-litter effort to a strong recycling program. Yeah, I, I think, again, uh, that uh, when I'm going out on Green Up Day, uh, I see the litter on the highway. If they're talking about litter, for instance, um, I still see all kinds of returnable cans and bottles on the road. I see far fewer plastic bottles out there of other substances. So from a litter perspective, I, I'm not buying it. Um, secondly, uh, I think that we should, I, I think it's up to uh, the recyclers, uh, as well as uh, those of us in, in the that have to oversee this, to, to make it more lucrative uh, to recycle. Right? If we can make it more lucrative, to make it a, a cost advantage uh, to to recycling versus disposing, I think that's where we'll make uh, the biggest um, mark. And uh, and I I believe that's the approach we should be taking. Again. You know, this other approach, it just uses up a lot of resources, and I'm not sure who's going to do it. I, I, the, I'm not sure that all of the redemption centers can handle this, and where do we store it? Where do we put it? Then what do we do? And they can basically, I, I don't see them, I think they have a hard time taking care of what they have right now without expanding it. But maybe, maybe I have this business all wrong. But I, I'm not seeing that it's that advantageous. It almost sounds like philosophically you're saying, let's recycle these plastic bottles through the single stream system as opposed to putting a deposit on them. Is Absolutely, yes. Yeah, no, I, I'm a huge recycler. I, I believe that we should be recycling every possible, thi every possible thing we can, and I do. But. I think there could be an economic advantage to the consumer if, if we could figure a way to make it more lucrative to dispose of your recycle uh, products versus your nor ordinary trash. I think that would make it even better. I'm not sure I know what like, you like if you Like if you have your recycling, you have your, your trash, so to speak, just to have some sort of more of an incentive to recycle. Uh, rather than throwing it away. Because that's what they're saying is happening right now, correct? That they're saying people are just disposing of their plastics and not recycling? That the recycling rate is considerably lower, yeah. I don't know who's counting all those plastic bottles, by the way, um, but there's probably a way to measure that. Governor, I'm not sure how familiar you are with this, considering it came out about 10 o'clock this morning, but are you familiar with um, Doug Hoffer's audit of the Department of Disabilities of Aging and Independent Living that came out this morning? I am not, but I have a Secretary of Human Services here that <laughs> might be able to answer that. Okay, so essentially my question is, in his audit, he found that the AIL is not inspecting facilities on an annual basis like they're supposed to. Timelines of following up weren't necessarily followed, and he kind of just found multiple issues with that and was just looking for any type of anything on that. Yeah, so the good thing about um, the audit that happened is, is it's consistent with, the with uh, some of the findings and investments that Dale's already identified and made, both by adding positions and adding 
uh, in the budget and adding um, additional inspections. So I think the good thing about the findings is there was nothing outside of what had already been identified by the department, just further reinforce that they're on the right track. Maybe just a <clears throat> quick follow-up on, on that. I mean, do you, do you think that maybe the department does need more oversight of, of these facilities? Um, certainly during the pandemic, long-term care facilities were in the spotlight, and I think it was put on Vermonters consciousness a, a lot more. I mean, is that something do you think that, that lawmakers should be looking at, maybe? So a lot of the regulations around uh, long-term care facilities um, are sit are and do sit with the federal government um, and with CMS. And so what we saw during the pandemic is it was important for us to focus uh, with those facilities on responding to the pandemic. And during that time period, um, they, the, the normal and usual business, as with many other things, didn't happen. What we've seen is that we've returned to that. They're catching back up. And so I feel like the, what we have in place right now um, and particularly with the added, um, the added resources that are in the Dale budget are sufficient um, for our current long-term care facilities. Governor, I'm hoping to get your thoughts on the school safety bill that's probably gonna get through the Senate here today. Um, kind of in the wake of Nashville, where do you think we are in general in terms of school safety in this state um, and also um, it's to my understanding that the recent amendment that would kind of exclude these behavioral assessment teams from certain schools that don't already have them, but you weren't in favor of that. I just wanted to see if that was correct. Dan? Yeah, I think, you know, firstly, uh, we're really appreciative for the legislature taking up our interest in improving uh, the statutory framework for school safety. We think it's really important. Uh, it's a conclusion we had come through last summer, so it's not really related to contemporary events. It's just as we were uh, contemplating how to improve our statewide disposition of school safety, we, we identified a need to strengthen our statutory framework. Um, and our recommendation is that basically things that have been essentially voluntary over the years become mandatory. And those things pertain to physical safety, the drills, uh, the planning, and then the behavior threat assessment. Uh, so we are concerned that um, basically when we had recommendations that left to this, this pattern of inequality and, and inconsistent implementation around the state, and I think that's something we struggled with over the summer and ultimately led to our conclusion that we need to bring forward a recommendation to make things mandatory uh, because we had a hard time uh, justifying how some schools could be more safe than others, essentially, and all schools need to be safe. Um, and I'm, I'm quite optimistic, as I know our team is in DPS, that behavior threat assessment is a really proactive uh, element of our layered response and it's really important that all schools engage in that. So we look forward to continue the work in partnership with the General Assembly, but uh, from my perspective, the behavioral threat assessment should be a mandatory approach. Okay, thank you very much.